they might have a thirst, but if they don't have drive and they can't demonstrate that drive, then, then we don't hire them. And I'd rather take somebody with a lower caliber degree um, or, or who may have done a job that's not quite right, but they, they demonstrate that, that drive to us. But typically, yeah, we focus on cap value, foot pound per acre. We focus on replacement cost. You know, ultimately, what are you buying something for versus a replacement cost? If you're at a discount, that puts you in a really good place because you know you're ultimately buying the buildings cheap. You might be getting the land for free. Deals are difficult enough to do. They, um, they're often complex. They often have pressure surrounding them, whether it's reasons for the vendor selling or you deploying capital. And sometimes they have touch points. And if you know the person on the other side, you're much more likely to have a personal rapport and be able to deal with those touch points in a, you know, in a, in a more sensible manner. Welcome to the People Property Place podcast. Today, we are joined by Crispin Gandhi, CEO of Argo Real Estate. Argo is a dynamic UK-based thematic investor focused on delivering outperformance for their investors. As a group, they've concluded circa 2 billion of transactions and have expertise across all mainstream asset classes, investing across core to opportunistic risk profiles. Prior to joining Argo, Crispin was previously head of Investec Property in the UK. He has over 25 years experience in the industry, working for companies such as Exemplar Properties, Schroders and Knight Frank. He holds a BSc Ons degree in Estates Management and is a member of the RACS. And it gives me great pleasure that he joins me on the podcast today. So welcome, Crispin. Thanks for having me. Not at all. Well, look, um, we'll get on to Argo and the business and the market and how you yep. see things. But a place that I always like to start these conversations is how and why did you get into real estate? Um, it, it was a family friend, actually. It was a, a friend of my father who was a very charismatic individual. And I didn't really know what I wanted to do when I was, when I was younger, probably in my teens. And I went to go and spend a couple of days shadowing him. And I like what he did, and it, it wasn't really the real estate aspect of it. It was just that he had a very social career. And I love that fact. I love the fact that he met a lot of people, a lot of different people involved in a lot of different things. And then that led, led me to go to Oxford Brooks and study real estate, um, estate management, as it was at the time. Um, and from then, having done the course at Oxford Brooks, I, I thought I'd go traveling, but ended up getting job offers, and so never went traveling. And um, took a took a job took a job on the um, the graduate placement scheme at, at Knight Frank, and um, yeah, spent a couple of years on the graduate placement scheme, and then ended up uh, staying there for for five years. So there's no so, family, no friends, other than your your father's friend who is in property. Uh, that's right. Yeah, it, it, it was simply him, and um, you know, and it, it was that social aspect that I love. It wasn't even the real estate aspect, and I think. You know, and so in many respects, I've been fortuitous that I love real estate and I love what I do. And I've been lucky to to get involved in something that that you end up being passionate about and, and, and driven about. But it, um, you know, it's really that social aspect that I love to begin with. How at school, what kind of kid were you at, at school, if you can cast your mind back um, that far? <laughs> um yeah, I love my sport. I love my sport at, at, at school. I think I was quite a social kid. I was I was not the most academic kid, but I wouldn't say I was unacademic. But um, I wasn't passionate about school. I couldn't see I couldn't see the, a lot of the the benefit of it. You know, I need to be I need to be motivated by something. I need to see the benefit of doing something. And um, you know, I certainly you've got that uh, more latterly. Um, and I think I, I kind of winged my way through my A-levels. So I winged my way through my degree. It was all quite last minute. And um, but yeah, that then gets you out the other side and gets you where you need to be. And then when you kind of met this um, friend of your father and you could see how social it was and you weren't necessarily right behind a, a desk doing reports or essays all the time, it was like, actually, I can get behind this and this is quite interesting and exciting and actually probably playing to more of your 
skills and interests if we kind of think about the sports aspect that you touched on? Yeah, and that, that, that was a key aspect. I think, um, you know, not being behind a desk all the time, I think I found that, that quite attractive. And also I could see that he wasn't doing the same thing every day. Every day was slightly different. And I think that I also found that that quite interesting. Um, you know, certainly, certainly the sporting side, I think, um, you know, that, that that's more about the sort of drive and passion and motivation when you get stuck into something that you're good at and you want to get better, that's that's where that side comes out. And I think, um, you know, that's been key throughout a career is being being motivated and driven and, and passionate by what by what you're involved in. So you landed at, at Knight Frank, did the graduate scheme there? Yeah, it was it was um it was a brilliant course. I think there were probably 10 to 15 in my rotation at the time. We just so the recession was in the early 1990s and we were coming out of the the recession which actually in many um ways had similar characteristics for to to the period we're in we're in now. Um and it was a it was a growth period and we were one of the first sort of years of graduates coming back into that growth period. Um and I did um we did six monthly rotations in the various different departments. Um and then I ended up getting a, a placement in the investment team. Uh working with um some some excellent guys who I'm still connected to um and still got a lot of time for and uh, we were mainly um, buying and selling portfolios, um, investment portfolios in the UK. Um, and yeah, it was a great time. And it was also a great time because it's where you make a lot of your contacts. We were penniless graduates and you used to go out on a Thursday night, but we had no beer money. So we used to go out on the company and they often used to have sort of drink rotation type events and you used to go and meet people from other different companies, go and meet and go out. And that's how you make your connections through, you know, which actually many of them I'm still in touch with now. Paid for socialising with a work benefit as well. Paid for socialising. So was, was investment always the route that um, you wanted to go down? Is that the seat you always look to kind of move into, um, having kind of rotated through a couple of different departments? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there were certainly, there were certainly some departments that I realised I was less interested in, uh, maybe the sort of landlord and tenant side and the um, property management side and the valuation side. But I think, you know, what I got out of those was they were hugely important. They gave you skills that were really important on the investment side. But but the investment side was where I wanted to be. Um, you know, I mean, was it the more glamorous side possibly? But I th- think it also played probably to my, my interests as well. And so the team itself was particularly portfolio orientated in terms of the types of deals you were doing. So rather than single asset, it was, you were buying portfolios? Yeah, the, the the partner I worked for, um, Alistair Graham Campbell, who who is still around and doing portfolio transactions now, he he focused on portfolios in those days, and um, we would either be selling portfolios or, or buying portfolios and working with our clients to work out um, either how we maximised um, you know the sell value for those clients or or how we um, put those portfolios together to find the right buyers. You moved after five years to Schroders. Um, yeah. What, how and why did that move come about? And why did you decide to move away from the advisory side to the principal side? Um, because I, I, I realised that, um, and I think agencies that developed an awful lot in these days and, and is, is much more about um, advisory work than brokery work, as a, as a broking work as it, as it used to be. Um, when I started out, and, and broking was quite simplistic. It was, it was on the buy side, it was basically matching you know, finding the buyer, being the first to get an introduction in. Um, and on the sell side, it was really advising them as to how they achieve best price. But it wasn't how you make money out of real estate. And I, I quickly realized on the agency side that I actually wanted to learn how do you make money out of real estate? How do you buy real estate cheap? How do you then maximize the value? And then how do you sell it at the best price? And to do that, I needed to go client side. So I went client side and I went to, to Schroeder's. I looked around and had, um, you know, various discussions. And um, I went and joined Schroeder's. I thought they were quite an interesting team. Um, at the time, I was, I was working on the transactional side and it, it laid again to my strength of contacts. I had numerous contacts um, who I could then lean on to, to help me find um, deals. Um, and 
it was not sector specific. So I could go and find deals across the various sectors, which at that time, you know, you know it was perfect of, for my jump across to, to the client side. And was that the Investable Universe office retail industrial at that stage? Yeah, it was. I, I think um, Schroders were perhaps at the forefront of um, some of the uh, less mainstream alternative investments. Um, but for me, it was predominantly retail, industrial and office. Yeah. yeah and in terms stage. of, was it kind of core plus returns that you're looking for or is it more value added or opportunistic or did it really depend on the mandate and the instruction? And the, the, it depended on the mandate and the instruction. They ran a balanced um, property unit trust who we used to do most of the buying for, but they did also run an opportunity fund um, and the balanced uh, property unit trust was a relative performer. So they just had to outperform a benchmark. It was unleveraged or very, very low leveraged. Um, and so the deals tended to be more core in, core in nature, but occasionally they would, they would put a, a, an element towards more opportunity type transactions. And if you can remember, what was the, what was the biggest kind of lesson or the biggest shift from going from an advisor to a principal in terms of transacting and deal making? I know it sounds obvious, but I think it was working out what real asset quality is and what the fundamentals, what, what actually really drives real estate. How do, you, how do you make returns based on locational, physical, occupational investment characteristics and then how you see that through a cycle? I think that that's what I learned the most, um, you know, and certainly I think you do that through, through some of the deals that you do, whether they're good deals or, or perhaps less good deals. Um, you know, the majority, I would hope, were good deals. And I kind of got a bit frustrated in the end. It was going, um, you know, I left in 2006 and that was a time when, um, when funds were spending money, I would call it, rather than investing money. You know, it was about getting money into the market rather than perhaps doing the best deals. And I felt that we weren't necessarily motivated by always doing the best deals, which kind of was a gain to my motivation. That's what I wanted to do is, was the really strong deals and then, and then ultimately be, um, you, you, you know, uh, remunerated based on the quality of deals you do, not just, um, not just spending capital. And in terms of that role itself, was it everything from kind of origination through to asset management and disposition, or were you just focused on origination and maybe kind of structuring those deals? Yeah, you, you, you focus on origination and then there was an asset management team. And I think, um, you know, that, that, that's something I've always looked back on as to whether that's the, the right structure when you just purely originate and then hand over to an asset management team. You know, you sort of underwrite a deal and then they might pick it up and go, hang on a minute, have they underwritten this? You know, how, how involved are they in, in what actually goes on? And I, I think that actually feeds back to your point about team. You know, a team is a, a, a bunch of individuals who are all connected and where you have that disconnect, there's, you know, maybe the potential for the team not to work as well as it, as, as it could do. I'm not, not saying that that was the case, but it certainly was something that I took away from, from that role that if we, if we underwrote a deal, I want an asset manager um, to really be heavily involved in, in the underwriting of the deal. Providing some assumptions or absolutely. updates or like the, absolutely. Re the realistic, realistic aspects of what is achievable. Yeah, yeah, and 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 for the for the, you know, for the for the asset to be properly underwritten by by all who are going to be involved in making that deal happen. Because once you bought an asset, there's there's no going back. It's not like you can sell it the next day. You touched on you were at Schroders for four years or so, and then you moved to CIT. How how and why did that come about? So I mean, it, it, again, it was a, it was an interesting time in the market. It was it was two thousand and six, and and it felt quite throffy, uh, maybe similar to to the environment that we were in 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 um, twenty one post post pandemic, um, and I. I felt like the market might turn. I got my timing wrong by a couple of years, but it certainly felt like there was going to be opportunity at some stage around the corner. And I think, you know, in, it's one of those career moves in hindsight, should I have gone, should I have not gone? Um, and, but one thing I did learn, and again, I think this comes back to, to what I've always tried to do is, we have money to spend, but I'm not very good at spending money um, when, when I can't find opportunity. So I did very little during that cycle. It sat on my hands and it was a, it was a really frustrating time. You know, I would see others who were, who were doing deals and I was kind of not doing an awful lot. And I was sometimes questioning why I'm not doing much. And I think the reality is, is because it probably wasn't a good time to be investing capital. 
so um, you know is 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 brought out um, a couple of years later. So, um, but I, I still learned a lot. You 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 learn a lot wherever you go. Um, I learned a lot about leverage transactions. You know how the debt markets work, um, and and how you can um, you know then sell back to the institutional market that I used to work for. Um, so you certainly you certainly gain elements from it. But it was a it was a slightly frustrating period, not actually being able to to you know do as many transactions as you would ultimately like, because that's why I was you know brought into that that particular um, uh, company. And was it kind of the first time where you kind of touched on like debt and structuring? Was that the first time it was uh, more um, you know mathematical or more of a financially orientated structuring type approach to real estate transactions or not? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, we we we'd always been, um, you know, even at Schroders, we were mathematically motivated, but the structuring, the leverage, definitely um, added uh, uh, another element to it. And and certainly, you know, again at Schroders, the balanced uh, property unit trust was um, tax exempt, so you didn't really have to worry about tax and you know, stru- you know, those, those those elements. So. Going into a leverage field and learning how to properly um, structure deals in a tax efficient manner, and then also add leverage. Yeah, it was an interesting um, was an interesting learning curve, and 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 then actually learning um, how leverage really impacts a deal as we went into the um, the GFC. That that was fascinating. Can you can you share some learnings on 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 that? Well, yeah, it's just ultimately that uh, the amount of leverage you've got um, can, and, and, and the sort of ratio of leverage you've got will greatly um, influence the volatility of returns. Um, and, and therefore, you know, when you were leveraged at 90, 90% or possibly even 95%, there wasn't a lot that needed to go wrong for, for your equity to be wiped out, for you not to be in control of transactions and, um, sorry, the, the, the assets that you owned. And, uh, for the consequences to not be great for your for your equity investors, for for which you're ultimately responsible for making returns. Um, so yeah, real estate is often um, classified as a bit of a herd, or there's a herd mentality that comes with with real estate. Um, was there a herd mentality back at that sort of time in the market as well? Yeah, I, I think there there definitely was, and and the reason being was there was limited risk in. You know, effectively putting in minimal equity and and taking um, and taking bank debt, but um, in some respects, it's got similarities to to what went on in the industrial cycle in in twenty one. You know, everyone felt that the industrial market was paved with gold, and and ultimately yields, um, you know, were in a sub three um, percent, and people were paying hugely aggressive prices, not necessarily looking at asset quality and and how they would drive performance. They just wanted to invest in the sector, um, and, and we certainly got uncomfortable with that. And we were early investors into into um, that particular sector as well as some of the the, the urban retail warehouse space and. And certainly we saw the signals when we would be trying to bid on assets and we were somewhere between 20 and 40% behind the pace. And that kind of just suggested to us that that things were, um, you know, very, very overpriced and that perhaps we should be looking at the exit of our portfolio rather than hanging on. You know, none of us could have seen what happened in with the Ukraine war and, and with Liz Trust and the impact of inflation and, and what would happen. But certainly we just felt that there was um the the that pricing had pushed to a level that was not sustainable for the long term. And so that's obviously kind of the, the, the Argo piece two thousand one, kind of the exit of those portfolios that you kind of touched on. Twenty one, yeah. Twenty one there. Is that is that because you knew the real you touched on um people weren't necessarily looking at asset quality or or um really at the fundamentals of it. Is that because you are so ingrained in the sector, you know it so well, you, you are that's why you're twenty to forty percent off the price, because you are actually being more conservative in terms of your underwrite and actually what's realistic in terms of a return? I think that's right. I, I think that you, you you get to a position, or investors get to a position where they've raised capital, and they're they're almost forced to 
to spend that capital. You know, the capital is there and it's waiting and they've got to invest it. And then they're in competition on the asset. There might be 15 people bidding. And so they dial up the rental growth assumptions. They pull in the exit yield assumptions. They forget about CapEx. They forget that the assets leasehold. And, um, you know, and, and therefore they're producing a return on paper, a forecast return on paper. But actually, in reality, can the asset actually achieve you know the return that they're that they're suggesting, and and the two might be quite different, um, which means that you end up in a situation where people are overpaying for assets. So there's um, synergy between kind of that 07, 08, 09 period with twenty one. Kind yeah, of there, there, there is there, there is in the industrial sector definitely. I, I think there are some synergies certainly in terms of the herd mentality. Both were both were different in terms of um, you know the reasons why why people were uh, placing capital. One was a debt related. You know the debt was cheap and and, and uh, you could get great leverage in two thousand six two thousand and seven, and in two thousand twenty one it was more of an equity driven situation and also that. People had identified a particular sector. It was a very polarized market, um, you know, where people didn't know where to go. It was really, oh, the industrial sector is about the only place to invest. Living was slightly behind, but the industrial sector was was full on. And so all the capital was focused in one sector. And, and the reality is it was the competition for that capital to invest in a certain sector that was driving pricing to, to unsustainable levels. You were at CIT for a couple of years before moving to exemplar properties. How yeah. and why did that come about? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it was interesting. It was an opportunity at the bottom of the market. And exemplar was a well-known um, central London developer. Um, but at that time in the market, they, they didn't have any, um, any investment capabilities and then they wanted to build an investment management platform. And um, the, the reason being that ultimately, um, I think they felt exposed purely to the development sector and they were worried that it might take a while for it to come back. Um, so I spent um, just over two years there helping them build um, an investment platform and we did various deals. It was a really tricky time trying to um, persuade capital to invest in deals at, at the bottom of the market. Um, there were certainly huge opportunities around, um, but it was it was fascinating being there and, uh, and we did some great deals. So kind of moving from a kind of a private equity shop to a developer to set up an investment management yeah. type platform. Yeah, yeah. And the other thing that was interesting for me was I wasn't just um, investing the capital, I then have to asset manage um, the the deals. And that, that was really interesting. And I actually found that I love the asset management as much as I love doing the transaction. You know, it's actually really interesting taking this thing from, you know, from, from cradle to grave and taking it through that cycle and, and extracting the value and going on that journey. And do you think you became a better investment manager or a better investment professional having gained the more tangible asset management 100%. planning experience as well? 100%, because you realize how difficult it is to, to extract the value out of, out of these things. It's very easy to put assumptions down on paper, but then when you've actually got to do it, it inevitably takes more time, costs more, and there's complications along the way. And I think what it also teaches you is that you need a flexible business plan. You need assets that you've got multiple business plans for. So if one route doesn't work out, you can go another direction and still make good return. You know, if you're solely stuck down uh, um, one route, that's, um, you know, it's certainly much more risk should be, should be applied to, um, you know, to, to the deal. You moved after a couple of years, you touched on, to Investec, South African investment bank how yeah. and why did that come about and can you just tell me about the role that you went there for and how maybe that evolved over time yeah it was interesting actually because um investec i went in there initially they were they were looking to to launch a, a fund and this was effectively um they they were a south african originated bank who had um dual listed both on the johannesburg and london stock exchange and they were FTSE 250 listed so you know it was the opportunity to to help them build a plop property platform. They were in the property debt space, but they weren't in the property equity space. Um, and, it, and it was interesting going there and learning to deal with um, individuals from foreign jurisdictions and 
um, certainly they felt they knew London real estate or, or UK real estate and actually having to educate them on how the market really works, how we transact, the broker market, um, you know, all the things that are, that are different over here. And we realized the best way to enter the market was actually to, to join venture. They wanted opportunity returns, but they didn't really, they weren't really prepared to take the risk themselves. So we essentially went in and um, backed property companies, asset managers who would have an asset, have a business plan, but perhaps not have all the ca uh, all the capital for it. So we would come in and provide perhaps 90% of the equity, they would put in 10% of the equity, and then we would work out a promote structure and a, um, over and above a hurdle, a, a typical PE type model. Um, and that's how we got into, into um, the UK market. And we had a successful run until 2016. And at that stage, we then got more confidence and we'd done a, a number of transactions actually with um, with my now colleague, Gavin Rabinovitz. Um, we, we had limited um, capital because we were using the bank's balance sheet. You don't want to bust the bank's balance sheet by doing mega deals. And, and therefore, um, we, we tended to club our deals. And I clubbed a lot of deals with Gavin. I'd show him my deals, he'd show me his deals, and we would um, co-invest in these deals alongside each other. And, and it worked really well. And then in 2016, um, we decided to set up a joint fund ourselves and actually invest directly in real estate rather than backing um, the, the, the partners. We would go and invest directly ourselves. And so we set up a joint fund and, and um, invested. And that's hence our, our industrial journey started. Um, we weren't sector specific um, and we invested cross sector but we invested in quality real estate and fundamentals, you know, real estate fundamentals were key to how we invested during that time and, and remain key today. Quick one from me. If you haven't already subscribed or followed this show on the podcast or app where you listen or watch, please do. It takes 10 seconds and helps tremendously. I've got really big plans for the People Property Place podcast and that one small action really, really helps grow the show and the presence and enables us to keep doing what we're doing. So if you haven't already, please follow or like on the platform you watch or listen to. Thanks so much. And so it was a, it was a fund that you both created um, kind of value add returns still UK focused cross sector. Um, were you just deal deal led or we were actually called plus and uh, uh, at that stage in in the returns that we were looking for. Um, we were cross sector UK focused, um, but I think whilst we were called plus, really we were core plus risk value add returns was ultimately what we were looking for. So assets that. There was an element of mispricing, sectors that we felt might have been slightly overlooked, but the underlying real estate quality was there. And, you know, certainly that's how we invested throughout the, the cycle until 21. So we invested in um, multi-let urban industrial and we got into that sector early and could see the growth that was coming through. We invested in supermarkets and bought a portfolio of supermarkets where the, um, the vendor perhaps, um, they had an eye elsewhere and didn't realize that these were excellent trading supermarkets, really resilient, and that the tenants wanted to stay and that we could re-gear the leases. We then re-geared the leases. We bought into the retail warehouse sector. It's actually really interesting. We bought into the retail warehouse sector when it was completely out of favor, um, when um, everyone thought the internet was gonna take over everything. Um, and what we realized was the, the locational quality of the retail warehousing was, was phenomenal. It was actually better than the, the urban industrial assets that we were buying. But we were able to buy those assets at a discount to industrial values. And we just felt that was a complete disconnect. And so we bought a number of um, retail warehouse assets at a real discount to what we felt their true value would be. And then people recognized um, post, post the pandemic that actually retail was resilient. People did want to go shopping. They wanted to shop out of town. And oh, these assets are extremely well positioned. 
And we were able to then sell on those assets at a, at a, at a price that actually people recognized the, the real merit of that. Um, so, so yeah, it was, a, it was an interesting mix of assets. And I think the taking that sort of opportunity approach to find deals, you know, we always remain quite entrepreneurial in the way that we approach deals and tend to be um, early investors into some of these thematic strategies. And um, that's the, and when you look at things based on a on a fundamental pricing basis, you base it on a cap value per square foot, uh, you know, pound per acre basis. You can sometimes see those those um, you, you know those disconnects and opportunities to to invest. Are they the kind of the metrics that you look for? Because I assume if you're a um if you're kind of UK focused, but you can be sector agnostic in terms of what you invest for, but you're looking for some sort of edge or angle. How do you start with supermarkets, out of town retail, logistics, offices, nurseries, student resi? Like, how in this kind of investable universe, how do you start trying to pin or how do you try to box off areas of focus or mispricing or yeah, opportunity? Because surely there's just, just a vast quantum of stuff you it, could look at and you can get distracted quite it, easily. You definitely can. And I think that you you, de- you do need to be quite careful on that. So for instance, you know, I think the living sector is a phenomenal sector, but we don't, you know, we're not, you need to be an operator in that space to really understand that sector. And, and we are not an operator. So in that sector, we will bring in operating partners and it's not somewhere we ourselves will go and um, necessarily and, and really look to invest unless it's too good to be true. And when it's too good to be true, it normally isn't too good to be true. So we have a second look and then we say, actually, you know, perhaps let's not, or, or let's go and um, get some external help on this with an operating partner. If it still remains too good to be true, then, then, then we might look to invest. But, but typically, yeah, we focus on cap value of foot, pound per acre. We focus on replacement costs. You know, ultimately, what are you buying something for versus a replacement cost? If you're at a discount, that puts you in a really good place because you know you're ultimately buying the buildings cheap. You might be getting the land for free. Um, so so there, there are those key metrics, but also looking at the, the fundamentals of the building. If it's an office building, does it have the right floor plate? How far is it from cross rail? You know, what's the slab to slab height like? Height like? Can you put in, um, you know, um, it, what's the aspect like? Does it have natural light on three or four sides? Is it a corner building? All these kind of things feed into, into how you look at an investment and what you might be able to lease it for um, and then ultimately sell it for. Um, and, and I think it comes down to two things. We're looking for oc- occupational liquidity and we're looking for investment liquidity. You know, the most tenants who are going to be attracted to that building and um, the most investors who can be attracted to an exit. That, that's ultimately, if you can get comfortable with it, those two elements, then you know you've got a, a good opportunity. And you articulate that to the agents, the agent network you built up to kind of bring, bring deals on and off market to you as well. Yeah, you do. You, 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 you do. You go through your, your, your broker network and ultimately, um, you know, we, we, you, you have to focus again on, on your track record and reputation of doing deals. And particularly when you're investing in early cycle and in uh, markets that are more difficult, you, you want to be able to see those transactions through. So you give um, the broker network and the vendor um, certainty of your ability to transact. And quite often, you also need to know the vendor on the other side. So it's not good enough just to know the broker. You actually need to know that the, the person who's selling on the other side. So having been in, in the fund management industry or you know having been in the market for 25 plus years, you get to know a lot of people across the market um, people are working in the institutional market and therefore you know them personally. And I think it's really important that you, it's old school, you shake hands on a deal and you, you try and make sure that deal happens, you know, and in a manner that is, is fair and sensible. You, you touched on the importance of know, knowing people on the other side. Can you just explain why, why is that so important to have that um, to have that relationship or um, professional relationship outside of kind of brokers or advisors operating or trying to make a deal happen in, on, on your side? Because deals are difficult enough to do. They, um, they're often complex. They often have pressure surrounding them, whether it's reasons for the vendor selling or you deploying capital. And sometimes they have touch points. And 
if you know the person on the other side, you're much more likely to have a personal rapport and be able to deal with those touch points in a you know in a in a more sensible manner. Um, and, and certainly, again, I, I think we, along with our track record, which is hugely important, you know, we have a, a track record on two bases. One is to our clients and, and, and how we invest their capital, but two is within the, within the market of actually um, doing deals and our reputation for doing deals um, within the market. And they are both hugely important to our business that we maintain our, our reputation and track record because ultimately, that gets you de- deals in difficult times as well, because people will know that you will you will get the deal done. You'll do what you say you'll do. You'll do and what you, you say. You might not do. be the what the highest price, but actually in terms of certainty of an exit, or certainly in terms of transacting, they'll they'll trust that you're the. Yeah. So I mean, we've just we've concluded two portfolio transactions over the last um, you know twelve months, and it, it was not long after the the Liz Trust period, and I think people were still very concerned about the inflationary environment and. You know, we saw an opportunity to to invest um, at a time when others weren't in the market and buy quality assets. But we we managed to transact those because um, you know the vendors realised that we had the reputation and we would get those deals done. And you know there weren't many people who were actually prepared to put um, significant amounts of capital into the market at that stage. But we did, and I think we're now um, you know seeing the benefits of doing that. So you had the the JV or the fund with Argo. Can you just talk to me about the transition from you leaving Investec to join Argo full time? Yeah, sure. So it, it ended up being part of a recapitalization of the fund um, that the management company was was also sold, and we effectively then joined Argo uh, full time as as employees. So some of my team came across to myself, and uh, we then looked at the opportunity to grow the fund again. Um, you know, fully inside Argo, and I'd really been working with those guys for for a long time, both um, through our opportunity deals um, that, that we'd done since 2010, um, but then also uh, in, in this joint venture fund that we've been running. So it was great to join Gavin and the team and, and, and go again and, and grow that business. So for someone who hasn't heard of Argo, um, can you just paint a little bit of picture over and above what you've maybe mentioned already, just in terms of the business, the size, what you kind of do? Um, and the team as well. Yeah, so we, we're a privately owned business. Um, there's there's about 14 of us in the, the team. We focus on the UK. Um, our sweet spot is really core plus to value add. Um, and we have been thematic in, in how we've approached the market, very much focusing on the industrial market of late. Um, but we're opportunity driven in terms of we're, we're sector agnostic and we're quite entrepreneurial in terms of where we look and how we find value. So uh, we're working on a number of different projects at the moment. Um, to give you an example, one is uh, a student accommodation scheme up in York. Um, as I say, students not you know live the living sector is not something that we um, specialise in, but we saw an opportunity and saw value, and um, that 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 is something we're working in a joint venture um, actually with one of the people you've had uh, formerly on your podcast, Nigel Henry. So so that's one situation. We've got a data centre opportunity. Um, we've got our industrial platform where we've got a, a, a capital partner in there, um, and uh, having sold out in twenty one, it's now really a a sort of new phase of, of growth for us. So, and we typically invest our money, our balance sheet money alongside um, uh, our high net worth client money. And then we go and um, partner alongside uh, institutional capital. And um, in terms of kind of that exit in 2021, that was some of the earlier stuff you bought from an out of town retail perspective that you touched on earlier, right? Yeah, so so we ended up exiting, um, you know, the best part of half a billion uh, of assets, both across the industrial sector, retail warehouse sector, um, supermarket sector, and a couple of life science assets as well that sat outside the the, the fund. So, you know, we had a good we had a good run. I think. Um, we, we, we picked our timing quite carefully and we monitored the market really carefully. And actually, we didn't go through a wide marketing process. We were happy actually to do off-market deals um, on two particular portfolios. Um, and again, it was about certainty. It was about the quality and caliber of the parties that we were dealing with. We were very happy with the price. Um, and it was interesting, actually, because after the event, you kind of almost go through that little panic. Could we have got more? You know, the market actually still 
still continues and you're sort of like, oh, have we done the right thing? Um, but then looking back, you realize that you might not have got 100% of peak pricing, but you probably got 97%. But what you did was you got your timing right when everyone wanted to invest at that particular point. So, you know, they were prepared to take views. They got the deal done quickly. We never even met um, one of the parties who, who we transacted with. And, you know, for the scale of portfolio they were buying, we, we thought that was quite surprising. And are these all these little one percenters you kind of look for and you look out into the market and we touched on earlier in terms of you trying to get your head around underwrites and pricing. Are these all the indicators that you look for to go, right, we're, we're getting to the top now and actually we need to kind of think about exiting and, and selling our own kit? Yeah, I, I think certainly we, we were definitely feeling we were getting towards late cycle, particularly when investors are buying more secondary assets, but pricing them as if they were prime. Um, and putting in assumptions that we couldn't really understand, driving, you know, putting in some pretty aggressive rental growth assumptions. And ultimately, you know, you just look at the cap rates that people are putting on transactions and when you're, when you're putting a cap rate on, on some of the assets in the twos. Uh, and you look at that on a cap value of foot basis and you look at where they would then have to exit that asset off and how much growth they would have to make. And you kind of, you can't stack that deal up yourself. You know, it's probably time to um, to go. Is there a part of you that goes, what's their edge? What's their angle? Like, how are they trying to, you know, if it's a shared, is it like, oh, do they, is there access to power that we don't know about or an alternative, you know, to turn it into a data center? Or do you, yeah, do, you does don't... that kind of constantly feed on your mind in terms of like, how how are they going to be able to exit this? Um, you definitely think think that way. I like to think that we, you know, explore those angles before we do sell, so so we don't miss anything. And ultimately, at that time, it was all about rental growth. It was all about people putting in very significant amounts of rental growth, and and ultimately reflecting exit values that were were you know very toppy. So. I think we we didn't really think it was anything more than you know the strength of the market and and and, and the assumptions that the people are applying rather than we'd actually missed a missed an opportunity within our own portfolio. And, and the herd the herd mentality that we we the herd touched mentality. on touched on earlier. Something that you put a lot of emphasis on personally, but also Argo as the business is track record. Can you just expand on that for me? Yeah, so so track record and and, um, and reputation are that's our access to deals. So reputation is our access through through the broker market and through the vendor market to being able to to buy deals and making sure that they can see that you have the ability to transact. So that's hugely important to us. And then track record with our clients. Um, ultimately, that's that's how we get our capital. You get our capital. Because people know you're going to do a good job, you're going to provide good returns for them, uh, and and therefore we maintain that at uh, you know at all costs, and we co-invest uh, capital alongside um, you know our investors, and and ultimately we see that capital uh, and their capital as as our own money, so we make decisions on that basis. The real estate or any investment management. Um, world is not um, upwards only and um, you know, positive returns all the time. How, how do you reconcile a track record when it goes wrong or when a market turns or you've missed something or, or, what, or what happens? How do you own that? Yeah, ultimately, I think when when you see that money is your own, you you do the right thing by your clients, and you know there are sometimes situations. Fortunately, it's um, you know it's it's relatively rare for us. But when things don't go quite so well, you work bloody hard. You you really work hard to to work these assets through. Sometimes it requires a bit of patience. Sometimes it requires a change of business plan. Um, but ultimately, you know, quite often for, for limited reward, we will always make sure that we fight to get every penny of our, our clients' capital back and hopefully get them some return as well. The CEOs that I talk to in the real estate investment management world, kind of typically three challenges that they have, raising capital, deploying capital or finding deals, and then hiring and retaining staff. Where, what, what are some of the challenges, uh, if, that, if that does ring true in terms of what's on your kind of plate, what are kind of the key challenges out of those three that you kind of face on? And if there isn't a key challenge that I've touched on, can you elaborate on what that might be? Yeah, I think, um, 
I think staff is is perhaps the least of our challenges. I think we've got a great um, team and it's born by the culture that we have within the business. And we have a very flat hierarchy. Everyone has a voice and everyone has a voice that's heard and, and is important. I come back to some of the you know things I said earlier about you can't underwrite a deal without having an asset manager's input. And, you know, we work across that basis across the entire team. And um, and it's really important. And I think that that's where the, the sort of team situation plays out. And we also have fun in the business as well. So I, I think that the, the hiring side is, is fine. I think um, the hardest thing at the moment is access to deals and quality deals. You know, we're in, a, we're in a, an environment where vendors are really trying to hold on. They don't really want to let assets go because they probably recognize that they're selling, selling them at a low point in the cycle. So accessing stock is one of the hardest things at the moment. And how how does one, having exited half a billion quid's worth of kit in 2001, 2000, sorry, not 2001, 2021, um, at like peak time in terms of the cycle, how, do you, how does one remain patient, um, having recycled a load of capital to investors, you know, clearly done well and um, looking for the next opportunity? How do you balance um, wanting to kind of go again with the practicalities and realities and the challenges in the market? Yeah, I think it's I think it's really important to remain disciplined. We we always will, and I think we will only do deals when we think they're super quality deals. And you, you, it's um, and and therefore it's about underwriting. Um, you know, it's about underwriting the quality of those transactions and making sure that the the returns are are genuinely good, um, and making sure that you are buying quality assets. You know, we we tend to focus very much on the property fundamentals and making sure that we, we will buy assets that we know will p- perform in the right in the right areas of the market. Um, but yeah, you have to remain patient. It's really important in this market not to just deploy, but to buy good quality assets. You've hired a few people in your time over the years. What are the kind of the values and behaviors you look for um, when hiring high performers? Yeah, it's it's interesting because um, you know we're really lucky with our team, um, and we put together a, a really high quality team. And I think, you know, for a small business, that sometimes is difficult to achieve when they might want to go and work at the the bigger, more glamorous firms. And I think one of the things we've always focused on, and and I think the caliber of individuals has got much higher since when I joined the industry, and people have. You know, they're, they're better educated, they've got phenomenal degrees, they've got phenomenal results. But but one of the things we always look for is drive, drive and commitment. You know, something that, that, that sets them apart than just having a, a phenomenal degree. You know, they might have a first, but if they don't have drive and they can't demonstrate that drive, then, then we don't hire them. And I'd rather take somebody with a lower caliber degree um, or, or who may have done a job that's not quite right, but they they demonstrate that that drive to us. And ultimately, you know, when when you're working as a business and you're a small business, everyone's got to be motivated for that common purpose. And we have a team of people who are driven for that common purpose. And it's it's that inner dynamo that is making them all give that extra ten percent. That I think um, you know it really helps your business perform. As we draw to a close, Crispin, a question that I ask everyone that comes on the podcast is if I gave you 500 million pounds worth of capital, who are the people, what property and which place would you look to deploy that capital as we sit here um, at the start of June 2024? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult question because when you say who are the people, I hope you would, um, you know, you, you'd invest in yourself. So number one, I'd say we'd back ourselves to invest. But I think um, you, there, there, there are some some long, um, you know, people have been in the the, the cycles before, and uh, Nick Leslau would be an obvious one to 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 talk about, who I think has done very well over the years, invested in in numerous cycles, and uh, and done well. So I'd, I'd probably follow Nick um, and Andrew Jones. I think is doing a great job at the moment um, in in his his taking forward his REIT as well. So you know, I think they are doing well, but I would say I'd rather the capital comes to me on the capital selfish. comes to you with Andrew and Nick as non-exact uh, exactly, or advisors exactly. Exactly.
Exactly. And then and then we can go and invest. Um, I think the market is more broad for opportunity than it has been in, in some time. And I think there is definitely some dislocation going on in the market. I think I think there is also some structural change, which um, which some will see as opportunity and some will perhaps fear, you know, the institutional markets going through a lot of change. Some of the defined benefit pension funds closing down. Um, you know, for, for for us, we see these period of dislocation as as real opportunity periods. This is our time to to invest. And yes, there may be, you know, different pots of capital, um, but it but it also means that those vendors, you know, that that that's where we go um, hunting from. And typically, they've actually been relatively good stock pickers, but they haven't necessarily had the ability then and the teams to asset manage to to a quality that maybe they would want to, and therefore we can pick up what are fundamentally good assets, then asset management um, them through, and then sell back to a a more core you know buyer when those um, when those investors reappear later in the cycle as they tend to do so. So place UK, any particular geography and uh, property type, you're pretty agnostic. You'll be opportunity led. We, we, we're we're opportunity led, but I think um, you know we still we still very much favour the industrial market. Um, I, I think um, power is also important at the moment. There are opportunities within power. Um, you know the AI, AI is definitely going to affect our market, and and um, but it needs infrastructure. It needs a backbone, and that that backbone is is really power. So I think that's that's quite interesting. Um, but but I, as I say, I think the opportunity is quite broad. We we typically tend to focus on urban areas. You know, urban areas are great because you've got um, you know different occupier trends that are all focused on those same patches. Whether it's the living space, whether it's industrial, whether it's iOS, whether it's student, well, whatever it is, you know, they're all trying to grab the same land, and there's only so much of it. And, and they all want to focus within those urban patches. So, um, as I said before, you know, if one business plan fails, another one, you know, is is there, and that's particularly um, prevalent in in the urban space. As someone who's worked advisory side, core institution, private equity business, developer, uh, gone to a, a bank, and then uh, is it a, a thematic investment manager at the moment? What advice would you give to someone who's maybe earlier on in their career who uh, would have the aspirations to have half the career that you've had? Um, I'd say be patient. And, and you know, what I've learned along the way is, is you pick up a huge amount from each role you're in. And, you know, some of it may, um, you may feel it's successful. Some of it, um, you know, there, there may be a bump in the road. But I think that, that's a learning journey. It's an opportunity to pick up skills. It's an opportunity to learn how the market works. It's an opportunity to, you know, to, to see how you may then sell on to that type of investor at a, at a, at a certain point in time. And, and I think um, it's, it's not a race, ultimately, um, and enjoy it. You know, it's amazing how quick um, the 25 plus years go, but make sure you enjoy every moment. Well, Chris Bin, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. I've loved hearing a little bit about your background story, views on the market and how you've been able to do a small bit of what you've been able to do. So thank you so much. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the People, Property, Place podcast. If you found it insightful, feel free to share it with a friend or colleague. Give us a rating, like or comment. It helps tremendously. It'd be great to hear from you on LinkedIn. I'm super open-minded to recommendations of guests that we should have on the show or areas of the market we should explore further. So do drop me a message. The People, Property, Place podcast is powered by Rockbourne. The team recruit leadership and future leadership hires for real estate owners, funds, investors, and developers. So if you're looking to hire top talent for your business, head over to the website, www rockborn.com where you'll be able to find a wealth of information or feel free to drop me a message on LinkedIn. Have a great day wherever you are and I look forward to catching you next time.